I'm here with Ethics Village, and today we have Jim Williams, who is going to speak on the subject of ethical issues in cyber attribution. And this is uh, intended to be an interactive session, so he will pose questions to you all and encourage you to answer, or you can ask questions of him as well. We would like that you line up for this microphone and speak into the microphone your responses or your questions, because we are recording for posterity. Right. Um, and if anyone is uncomfortable getting up on the microphone, you can tell me your question and I will phrase it for you. Okay? With that being said, we will get started. Take it away, Jake. Awesome. Man, I'm going to sit down because I've been standing most of the day, so my apologies here. Also, I'm going to stand across the there. Anyway, um, so, actually, you know what? I'm going to stand up for a It feels weird to sit down and, and talk here at the same time. Um, so, anyway, I'm going to talk today about ethical issues and cyber attribution. For, for those that don't know me, I'm going to throw this away on my slide up here anyway. Um, you know, I think that probably the big thing here is probably that bullet down there about the former NSA hacker, right? Because uh, this is something we didn't used to talk about a lot. Um, at all, and then the Russians did it for me. Right? So uh, I have a, a bias here, a significant bias, uh, with a whole shadow workers event, uh, for those that are recall of that. Uh, when they dumped a bunch of tools, they also added a few folks that uh, had uh, worked in previous cyber, you know, cyber operations, and um, that has definitely impacted my life. Right? So I have a, a kind of a stake here in understanding, uh, as well as uh, trying to normalize right, what are ethics around how we publish cyber attribution. Now, look, in their case, they were right. So, so they came out and said, hey, um, you know, you sure we talk a lot uh, about our operations for somebody who used to be involved in, in operations of your own. In other words, you've got skeletons in your closet. Um, and uh, made sure that I knew uh, that they had enough physical material to hurt me significantly. We'll just leave it there, right? And uh, I did exactly what they said in, in STFU, right? Um, because uh, I decided to, that I did a worse decision there, like we all do in BOSAC. And anyway, so. So I actually have quite a stake in this, and I think this is an important discussion that we really haven't talked about a lot, except for my own personal stake. I think there's a lot that uh, you know, we really don't talk about when we publish these, these attributions, right? So I want to walk through here. I'm going to make this a very, very interactive uh, interactive talk. And I'm very interested to know what your opinions are. I'll have to share some of mine as well. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, obviously, uh, you know, firsthand, uh, being firsthand impacted. Um, so that's a little bit about me, though, as far as this life. Look, if you have to call yourself a thought leader, you're not a thought leader. If you know you're a thought leader, people will tell you you're a thought leader. I hate it when people are thought leader in their bio. And I also hate people that have blockchain, needless to be solution. Right? Because that is a blockchain village down the way there. I'm not saying blockchain is bad. It's not. Blockchain has lots of great legitimate uses, right? Uh, anyway, uh, but, uh, but that said, right, uh, if you needlessly add it because it's cool or if you get you know, investments or whatever, um, you're just doing wrong. Right? So, um, look, uh, this is going to be really loose. I mentioned this before. My agenda is really loose uh, discussion, talking about some ethical issues and cyber attribution. I've got a number of different scenarios that I want to walk through. I highly encourage you to hit the mic um, for whatever reason, you know, from a uh, you know, of course, they are recording. If you don't want to, to be seen, heard, whatever, in the recording, of course, Shane offered, again, very very, uh, very graciously offered to take your question and pose it. Um, likewise, uh, if you can't get to the mic for whatever reason, um, I, I present SANS all the time, so I'm used to repeating the questions. We'll definitely get these on video so that we don't, uh, don't lose these for posterity, right? So, um, I'll mention here that, uh, you know, this isn't going to work if you don't contribute as well. You know, I can offer you my opinions all day, but I'm, I'm like one guy, right? Um, and, and I'm biased. I'm the first to admit that I'm biased. In fact, uh, two hours ago, for the Diana Initiative, um, I gave a talk on uh, cyber threat intelligence, and, and, and bias is one of the things we talked about. Right? So avoiding uh, bad CTI, and uh, certainly CTI is where we do a lot of that attribution at. Um, and uh, you know, I, I admit one of my biases is that I can't uh, publish about Russia in an unbiased fashion. Right? I'm the first to admit it. Right? Uh, they've impacted my life pretty heavily, and, and uh, I have a hard time uh, separating my emotion and my uh, you know, my, uh, my issues there with them, my personal issues there with them, uh, and the actual attribution, attribution itself. I also saw a great talk yesterday with Diana about, uh, it's actually from a lady that works over at Microsoft, uh, Diana Kelly, um, and she was talking about that as well as about IBM, or kind of IBM. And it was really fascinating. One of the things she talked about was the rush to publish. Right? And we have this in info stuff right now. And I'm not going to name any names, Bloomberg, but there's a rush in many cases to publish before you verify uh, you know, some of the information there, right? And, and again, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with the Bloomberg, Bloomberg story, you're living under a rock, but, but you know, basically that they published uh, that there was an example of, uh, you know, sort of a Chinese supply chain attack, uh, the super micro servers, and, and something the size of a, a grain of rice, a small circuit the size of a grain of rice could, 
that ultimately changed how the baseboard management controller worked. Now, now, that was really cool, and of course they never found any actual evidence of that happening. This is a really interesting analysis problem, though, right? Because the, obviously, you can't prove a negative, right? So it's very, very difficult to disprove a as with that negative. Um, and, um, yeah, that definitely huge there. But look, uh, you know, Supermicro lost a lot of money as a result of this, right? Their, their stock price took a dive. Um, they spent in, incalculable amounts of time, right? Incalculable amounts of time uh, working through, uh, well, trying to discuss at least through, uh, definitely internally, what message do we send? Were there any instances of this actually happening? Amazon and Apple were both cited in the story. Um, as having been impacted, they lost lots of money there as well. Uh, and money meaning money and time. And certainly there are customers, I have customers asking me, should I get off the Amazon Cloud? China's in my front home. Right? Well, that, that's huge. Right? You're talking about migrating away from Amazon and you're migrating over to Google because they don't use Super Micro or something. That, that's, that's a huge thing. Right? So, so as I look at this, I'm kind of like, ah, rush to publish. Right? What ethical obligations do we have there as well? And, and I really liked that talk yesterday. I uh, highly recommend it there. And that was something she really talked about was the if you're not first, in many cases, it's not worth publishing yet, right? So there's a lot of folks that, that feel that way, and, and as a result, you know, how are we addressing our ethical obligations and correctness there, and, and balancing those against the, uh, you know, against that whole rush? Yeah. So I want to talk about kind of my agenda here, more or less, uh, some of the questions that I want to get into. Um, obviously, uh, issues of participation. When I talk about participation here, um, the, the primary person that comes to mind is Park, right? So uh, Park is a North Korean hacker that we charged last year. Um, I actually had an op-ed in the, uh, we talked from last year the beginning of this year, I can't remember now. They're all bleeding together with the uh, DOJ charging foreign hackers, which I also have feels about. That's a legal question, not an ethical question, right? Uh, charging those nation state, uh, nation state actors there. Um, but uh, you know, in Park's case, uh, I, I really don't think Park had, had a choice, right? Uh, he, he worked for the North Korean government, right? North, North Korea doesn't come and say, hey, anybody, you want to do this over here? Because it would be really cool. In fact, probably cooler than planting rice. Which it is, right? Don't get me wrong, but I mean, I think at least I'd rather have the plant price. But at the same time, um, I don't know that he had a choice to say no. Right? I, I, in fact, I would argue he probably didn't. In fact, if you're not familiar with the North Korean government, um, they have uh, basically they have what they call the three generations rule, um, which is that uh, if you after the North Korean government, they kill three generations of your family. Um, it, it's a pretty powerful incentive to. Uh, well, not after the North Korean government, right, when it comes down to it. Uh, when they came and said, hey, uh, do you want to do this thing, right, I think that's a huge issue of participation, right? Um, and so as we look at our publishing, or us publishing cyber attribution there, um, does it matter? And we'll talk about that, right? Does it matter that that part was not free to choose, uh, choose his own adventure, if you will, right? Um, does the fact that family members, second and third order effects, right? So as we start talking about second and third order effects, does it matter? Uh, maybe Park didn't have a choice and we're okay with that, but if we know for a fact that the government uh, may take out on, or may take, uh, you know, actions out on uh, second and third order, uh, you know, folks there, uh, does that matter? Does that change how we need to address our attribution, right? Because there's the technical side of attribution, but what we're really trying to address in this talk is, is not the technical side, it's the what should you do, right? Um, not necessarily what, what can we do from a technical standpoint, but what should we do? Uh, then, of course, we have loss of life, right? Uh, you know, I, I have 100% uh, confidence that Park is not alive today. All right, so after we out of park, I have 100% confidence that he was killed by his government. Um, the, the easiest possible way to make sure that he doesn't become a bargaining chip is to make sure that he doesn't exist. Right? Um, now, of course, the North Korean government originally came up and said he doesn't exist. Right? Not only, right, if you've read a lot of the reports on the backside, they said, look, not only are you wrong about this, right, wrong about the attribution, you're, you're crazy wrong because the guy that you're talking about isn't actually a guy. Right? He just doesn't, and, and look, uh, that's going to be an embarrassing thing for them to back up on, right? And so I think, again, pretty confident here, uh, you know, knowing the uh, North Korean government and their, their wonderful ethics uh, and morals, uh, they, they took the guy out, right? So he probably sitting in a meat grinder someplace or who knows what, right? Bottom line, uh, ba bad spot there, right, from loss of life standpoint. If we know that's going to happen, does that, change, uh, does that change our obligations to publish or not publish? Then we have the possibility of false flags. In fact, at DerbyCon this year, I'm speaking on, uh, actually speaking on how to perform false flag attacks, right? So uh, kind of taking a look at, and, and, and I have an ethical issue with that too, by the way, right? So that's something we discussed a lot at uh, at Rendition, right, uh, is to, if we detail how this is happening, right, because we are observing false flag attacks in the wild right now, right? So the question then becomes the, should we then even be publishing on that? But, you know, the how-tos, right, uh, we actually, it does, you know, internally assess that the publishing 
publishing it is probably less damage than people thinking that false flags are something that don't happen, right? So, so we think that by, by opening that up, it's actually gonna start a bigger discussion around that, start more forensic examiners looking for false flags, and that itself actually is gonna increase our, the overall confidence or attribution. But as I say that, I'm gonna tell you I could be wrong. I could be 100% wrong and it's only gonna be used for bad and, and there's never, there's no good's gonna come of it. And, and I don't know and that's one of the things that we run into there but, but now I wanna take it back to from an ethical attribution stamp or ethics of attribution standpoint, does the possibility of a false flag attack or false flags in our data, does that impact uh, whether or not we should release attribution or, or publish on attribution? Um, I have some feels about that as well. And then I have issues of confidence in my attribution, right? Uh, my talk uh, with Diana today, uh, talking about CTI in general, right? We talked about the fact that we never have all the data, right? Never have all the data. I've never had an attacker call me up on the phone and be like, it was me. Totally it was me. We, we hacked it, right? And if they did, I gotta be honest with you, I question that too. Because it would be so out of the norm, I'd even question that. And so I always end up having to make an, at, you know, basically perform an attribution with incomplete data. And when I have to do that, I have to question then uh, if I'm doing this with incomplete data, um, what, what then, uh, you know, basically uh, what then uh, are the incomplete data points? Is that likely to change or invalidate my assessment? And, and look, if we're talking about loss of life here, that's, that's not something I can take back. Right? And I talked about being wrong. We actually talked about Kent's analog doctrine over at Diana today. And, and ninth point, for those that don't know Kent, Kent formed uh, basically the analytic framework of the OSS. Right? So the Office of Strategic Services before the CIA even existed. And uh, <clears throat> he put together a nine point analytic doctrine. But number nine is candid admission of mistakes. And I talk about to folks all the time in CTI, all the time in CTI, that your credibility is your currency. Right? We always have to make judgments without all the data there. Frequently those judgments are wrong. Right. By the way, if you get into CTI, cyber threat intelligence, and you don't want to be wrong all the time, you're in the wrong field, right? Um, because it's just a reality. You are going to be wrong a lot, and you're going to have to back up, assess, walk back assessments a lot, right? And it's not always your fault. It's because you have to do that. You have to perform the attribution. You have to get that data out there for your decision makers. But what's your confidence in that data? And what's the confidence of that attribution? And how confident does one need to be before in that evidence as well as the attribution uh, before uh, you actually go ahead and make that, uh, make that assessment? So I'm going to start off with a couple of scenarios here and, and again th this is a spot where I would love to get a discussion going um, so, so please hit the mic as we, uh, you know, as we kind of walk through some of these questions here because this is going to be 18 times more valuable, 1800 times more valuable with you actually participating than, than, than without. Right? I have lots of opinions on this. I'm happy to share mine. I'm actually not going to share mine first because I'm going to bias what other people in the room are going to say. Right? So I'm big on, on not biasing as well. Um, but uh, I'll happily kind of share my opinion on this where I sit uh, as, as we go, but I'd love to hear a couple of other thoughts. Here I've been uh, asked to provide attribution to a specific cyber operator, right? So they have bad OPSEC or let's call it incomplete OPSEC, right? Uh, where they have made mistakes that allow us to literally say this person behind the keyboard. Th this is what we're seeing done with the DOJ's uh, charging you know, Russians, uh, Chinese actors, uh, we charge a couple of Iranian hackers and finally Park over North Korea are the examples that I'm aware of at least. Um, now the operator, once we, uh, basically once we identify them, um, they, they're not gonna be extradited, right? So let's say that they, uh, let's say they operate in, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, we'll, we'll come up with a fake country here, uh, Russianistan or something, right? And, and they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to be extradited, right? But they're also not going to be killed, right? So the only thing that we're going to do is we're going to limit their quality of life uh, by ensuring that they can't travel because if they travel outside of Russianistan, um, then they will, uh, they'll find themselves in a, uh, in a bad spot. So this would be a, a, a quality of life issue for said, uh, for said operator. Um, the questions that I have here are what are ethical obligations in, in reporting our attribution? How confident do we have to be in the attribution? How does the quality or evidence play into our decision to publish the attribution report? Now again, remember the impact here is that, is that Joe basically is not, whoever this person is, is not going to be able to travel outside of his home country ever again, right? Uh, or we'll say indefinitely throughout, uh, throughout the future, right? And I actually have a question over here, is it? Yeah. Yeah, so you're asking, uh, so the question is how, how can we be so sure that Russianistan isn't going to kill said operator or get rid of this person? And, and I, I'm capitulating that here to make the ethical discussion. I'll get into that in a little bit to the year scenario. But the, uh, I, I, I'm starting here with an easy scenario. So, well, I say easy. Maybe it's not easy, right? Um, but uh, basically we're, we're willing to capitulate at this point that Russianistan isn't going to kill, imprison, negatively impact in any way said operator, right? So, so actually let's come back to the U.S., right? So, so we'll, take, we'll take that scenario, right? So let's say 
heck, I'll, I'll make it personal. Uh, let's say that I get charged in China, right? Um, it's pretty clear that China, you know, U.S. is not going to extradite me to China, right, uh, for my uh, crimes against the Chinese government, right? Um, but there are a lot of other nations that if I land there, even though they're friendly to the U.S., they're also friendly to China, and given a valid court order would extradite me there, right? So in this instance, um, in your scenario, the person, we're not concerned about them being charged by their own government. We're worried about... Yeah, so in this scenario, we're not worried about this, this operator being charged by their own government, only by a foreign government, again, which limits their travel and, of course, limits their quality of life. Now, I, I threw the U.S. example out here. Honestly, being locked to the U.S. is not a significant impact of quality of life impact issue compared to some other countries, right? If you, if you live in Morocco, let's say, Morocco is yay big, right? And, uh, you know, you probably want to travel to Spain and other areas and, well, maybe not Spain if you're from Morocco, but you get the idea. They, they have a big, like, butting head kind of thing going on there culturally for, like, thousands of years, so again, hence the, the thought there. But, but you get the idea, right? You might want to travel to some other country, and again, what, what's your uh, what's your obligation there? Uh, you're sorry. What's your uh, what's our obligation here in the attribution side uh, for impacting significantly impacting the quality of life of, of said operator? So I'd love to know. Does anybody have an opinion on this? Go ahead and hit the mic, man. All right. So I think it depends on your level of confidence, and if you're willing to disclose your level of confidence. Because if your confidence is relatively low, but you clearly disclose that your level of confidence is low. Then it becomes less of an issue. Okay, so we have that the uh, quality of, or sorry, the quality of our confidence, the level of confidence, plays into uh, plays into our decision if we disclose it, right? So, so that's uh, that's always key because we read a lot of CTI reports today and attribution reports where nobody actually talks about the quality of or the level of their confidence in, in a particular uh, conclusion. And then there's also a kind of a meta piece here, which is the confidence in your in your evidence overall, right? So there's confidence in your analytic conclusion, there's confidence in your evidence, and and those things are, are related but but separate issues, right? So are we willing to disclose that, and if so, uh, if so, you know, what? Sir? You have to, oh, I'm easy. Take your pick, go ahead. Well, there are two of you right in the same line there, so line of fire. Um, so you've only kind of talked about the one side of it, though, the, the impact it's going to have on the operator that, that we're potentially disclosing. Mm -hmm. You haven't really talked about why somebody would want to disclose and therefore what the, the counterweight or the benefit would be to the person disclosing. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So the, uh, basically, what's the benefit to us for disclosing and, and what ethical issues do we have in enforcing that disclosure? Because we're talking about the counterweight of this, right? Uh, but not necessarily the ethics. And in fact, I have a scenario coming up where that, that specific issue gets, uh, gets brought up, right? Um, so basically, as we have other impacts here, right, if we can prevent some, I say here, but uh, basically from our perspective, if we can prevent some action from happening by disclosing, right, how does that weight versus counterweight play out? And that, that's actually a really, really good point there. Um, I'd be interested to know, uh, do you have any thoughts in this scenario uh, under, you know, basically what, what weights might impact here? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, if, if the expectation was that by doing this, um, and again, it, it depends, I think there's lots of players that play through that, but by doing this, you're creating a higher confidence in being able to say that a particular government actor was doing it, and then that allows you to make you know, more back and forth between two governments as higher entities without mm -hmm. a single person. But I would be more likely to say it's because you have there's more people being impacted. Right. So, so basically, uh, the kind of the conclusion or the thought process, and I'm going to paraphrase here. Tell me if I'm if I'm missing the boat here. But the uh, basically that if by attributing this single actor, right, this uh, triggers diplomatic discussions between two nations that impact a much larger number of people, uh, basically then, uh, yeah, and, and forgive the wording here, but basically uh, this person, you know, using them as, as kind of that collateral damage or that pawn um, is okay, because, ethically okay, because we get a larger net benefit, right, as, as a result. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. And, and before you go here real quick, there's a gentleman over here. You had a thought? Just a quick comment on the last one. Uh, one of the issues was the level of confidence. I would argue it almost doesn't matter because consequence happens either way. Uh, yeah. I imagine they would still treat it the same, even if we're like, low level of confidence is this guy, he's still going to get it. Yeah, so, so the question uh, or the kind of the comment is, does level of confidence even matter, right? Because once we make the attribution, um, if the uh, basic of our level of confidence is low, medium, or high, that individual is still going to be, uh, going to be impacted, right, no, no matter what. Um, I, I guess from my perspective, when I, you know, you say kind of it doesn't matter in that scenario, I, I think where it matters to me uh, when we talk about that, uh, you know, that level of confidence side, it, it's the, does our level of confidence influence whether or not we, we actually report on the attribution in the first place, right? So I agree with you, once the attribution 
attributions out the door if you say, hey, I did this attribution, it's low confidence. I, I think I agree with you by and large, right, that, that largely it's not going to impact the, the outcome, um, but, but I think it should Personally, I feel like it probably should impact our decision to release in the first place, right? Um, if, if, particularly if we if we believe this to be an actual impact, a likely impact, I think that's probably where we where we consider that uh, that confidence level. I figure in this case, you probably don't want to go by the golden rule, uh, not release unless you're willing to be that person. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point, right? The golden rule, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? If you're not willing to be that person, if you're not willing to take this impact yourself in a similar scenario, um, should you then release that attribution? That's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting take, right? Because there's a lot of folks that have trouble with that whole, you know, the empathy side of being able to say, well, I would never have been in that position in the first place. I'd have never been, you know, I'd never signed up to be, a, you know, to be that, that hacker on the other side of the keyboard, right? So, so interesting, interesting point there. Right? Sir, you had a thought? Yeah, so what I'm really concerned about is the ethical obligations if we don't. Because yeah. here's the thing. When you're talking about Russia Stan attacking Ukrainian Stan, and you're doing... <laughs> <laughs> wanna cries, patches, not patches, black energy, whatever you want to do, and you go from one country to multiple countries mm -hmm. affecting all of our ways of life yep. for these, these international uh, rules and norms of affecting literally billions of dollars and also quality of life for people... I mean, don't you think we, we owe it to that whole government for not just our country, the U.S., forget that, but really a deterrence against a country who's using not just a person mm -hmm. but a tradecraft to go after the, the second, third, or fourth order effects yep. of the entire world as this, this is kind of this whole this, this world globalization is happening. So don't you think we have an obligation if we have a reasonable things of confidence because uh, we have Interpol. These people are, are you know mm -hmm. have indictments and that kind of stuff. And so – if we don't do that, if we're just thinking about just one level person, then move that person aside. What about the other 50,000 people right. who are doing that for that government? Is there not a deterrent for that country to not to be very focused on how they want to do these things? Yeah, no, I, I actually don't disagree with that, right? Uh, there, there really is a, I will absolutely agree with you that there's a, a human cost to cyber attribution, particular, or sorry, to, cyber, to not performing cyber attribution. Uh, you talked about the example of uh, Russia, Russia in the stand, uh, attacking Ukrainian in the stand. Uh, the heck with this, Russia versus Ukraine. Um, and uh, so as, uh, you know, I was trying not to annoy Russia any more than I have, but, but never mind, whatever, it's, <laughs> that cat's out of the bag. That ship has long sailed. Um, look, uh, realistically, uh, you know, w when I think about that, I do think you're right. I do think that there's probably a, uh, you know, a uh, definitely a convenience factor because here we're only talking about quality of life for one individual. If we talk about not patchy, not patchy impact to the quality of life for millions of people. No, no, no question. Impact of my quality of life directly doing instant response. I'll be the first to, first to share that. Uh, Maersk, as we know, uh, sent workers home um, and, and many of those workers never got back paid, right? So, uh, you know, impacted a lot of those people, I, I suspect, are working paycheck to paycheck, right? So, so I think here when we talk about quality of life versus quality of life, I think it's a pretty clear, I would agree with you, that's a pretty clear, uh, uh, pretty clear balance there, right? I think things get more complicated in some of the other scenarios that we'll talk about down the road. We're talking about quality of life versus versus definite loss of life or predictable loss of life, right? And I think that's where I think we'll have some more interesting conversations uh, conversations as well. Right? Yeah. Somebody, somebody interjected and asked if, uh, to clarify whether we're talking about this is an ethical decision for the, for our state <coughs> to do this or is an individual person? Oh, that's such a great question, right? So, so the question that got interjected or kind of thrown out there was, are we asking about the ethics of an individual performing this action and an attribution or the state performing the attribution, right? Um, I, I would argue that uh, I would argue that, that we have to discuss first at a personal level, right? I think that that's, uh, at least for me, and, and you could, at the end of the day, you can define the you know, basically define the discussion however you like, right? It could be that that indeed it is the, uh, you know, we're talking about is it ethical for the state to do it? Um, but but look, for the state to perform attribution, there are analysts working to do that attribution directly, um, and uh, they either choose to participate or, or not, right, in that action. Um, and so I, I think that we have to start at the individual level, but, but I do understand that we do have to have that discussion at a, definitely have that discussion at a higher, uh, yeah, state level as well, right? So yeah, that's it, man, that's a really good question that I don't, that I wasn't prepared to answer specifically. So hence me kind of like thinking through it on the fly. Great, whoever brought that up, awesome job, All right? Sir. So the, the question I have is, is just also like a place, let's say it's a, Russia is a, is a place very similar to a country next to South Korea where people routinely flee the government. So the, the kind of idea here is if we call somebody out, 
are we actually, are we, if we call somebody out who works for government where they're forced to do this thing, mm -hmm. maybe they're doing it unwillingly, are we stopping them from actually having a better quality of life? But not only that, but we also have to, if, it's a, if we're doing this as a state, we also have to take into consideration, are we actually blocking ourselves from uh, having this person potentially flee at a later date and then us turn them or us use them as a source of intelligence? Because we just burn that if we do this. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, right? We do have a, a possible issue there of, uh, you know, basically eliminating, let's say that person gets eliminated, right? Um, or, or doesn't flee or the, you know, the extra pressure on them prevents them from fleeing. We, we then couldn't use them as intelligence source. Also, uh, separately from an intelligence source recruiting standpoint, they would be very, very unlikely to work with the U.S. then in any in any capacity, regardless of, of the logistics of them fleeing, right? Um, you know, typically uh, we try and soften them up to be receptive to, to U.S. or whatever your nation is, right, home nation intervention, um, I, I would suspect that that would completely eliminate their desire to work with us. I, I don't know how, ethic, how much of an ethical question that is versus a logistical question, right? And don't get me wrong, I'm not nitpicking here, but I, um, I, I mean, I guess we could look at ethics being kind of like what's the greatest, the greatest good for home country. Um, yeah, that's where we're going with that. So, so greatest good for home country. But that, that's, that's a tough question. I, I, I certainly don't have a good answer for that, yeah. Yeah, but you're right. There are there are countries where, where that occurs, and, and and very primarily North Korea is a great example of that. Could we potentially, instead of providing the attribution down to the smallest denominator of the individual operator, instead provide the attribution to the level of a collective, be it government, threat actor group, et cetera, instead? Yeah, so this is a really good question, right? Instead of providing a, uh, basically providing attribution down to the human individual operator level, should we be providing attribution at a higher level? Could we achieve the same goals with that, right? And uh, I will tell you that is something that I am a huge, huge proponent of, as, as you all know, um, but uh, as you well know, um, but, uh, but a huge proponent of, and for that very reason, right? Because we are unlikely to impact the individual um, versus, uh, you know, ultimately versus, we can still get the same statecraft approach across without saying, no, no, is this person, this person person individually uh, was, was behind this, right? Now, on the other side of this, by the way, of course, we have to look at the ethics of upholding our own laws, right? Uh, obviously, the actions, these cyber attacks uh, against us, whether they are uh, a result of statecraft or not, they are illegal in, in our country, right? So whatever that country is that you happen to live and work in, um, if they get hacked, uh, ultimately, they are uh, you know, there, there's laws broken there. And, and of course, we have an ethical obligation to uphold those laws, right? Um, and so this is a spot where ethics, you know, starts to get very, very... Uh, but you can do your public attribution very different than how you prosecute or start looking at finding other things. So there can be a separation between the legal handling and the ethical public... Yep. Yeah, so, so to that point, uh, Jessica mentioned that there could be a uh, basically a separation of how you handle something legally versus how you handle something. Um, I apologize, I didn't mean to just, I didn't mean to just attribute you there, sorry. Um, that was unethical. Um, anyway, so the, uh, without prior consent. Um, so the, uh, yes, anyway, about that. Um, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> yes. So anyway, so yeah, you could separate how you handle uh, individual attribution from how you handle the legal side of of, of that, uh, you know, basically upholding our laws. Sir? And more to that point, it got me thinking that you could do kind of an individual attribution without naming the individual. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, provide a sufficient level of detail that a cyber operator in District Adam of City Beta of this country did this work to the level of degree that, you know, if your experience doing it, you see the report like that and you're just like, oh, they're, they know who I am without being named specifically, which kind of changes the, you know, separates the legal and ethical issues some. Additionally, I think there's some consideration as to who they're working for, mm -hmm. that there's going to be a difference whether they are working for the state or whether they are, say, in organized crime, mm -hmm. that it might have the same effect within the scenario that, yes, even someone operating in organized crime in this country, the nation-state yes. relations, they're never going to extradite them, but at the same time, it can have the effect of getting that nation to turn the screws on that particular organized crime group to say, hey, no, you're hurting things diplomatically, stop this action. 
Now, that's a great point. If you'll say at the mic for just a second, I actually have a follow up kind of, I'm interested to hear your opinion on this since you brought this, uh, you know, since you kind of brought this up, I, I'm 100% behind this uh, with the, you know, the, the, the organized crime group. Let me come back to the nation state, uh, nation state operator side of this because I, I think that's, I think that's where we have a little bit more uh, confusion around, you know, what is ethically right or not, right? When it's a cyber criminal operating outside of the state, um, I think that there's a little bit less confusion around that. But if we take back to the nation state operator, um, if I'm publishing to a level of detail that, that the individual, or sorry, if I'm, if the, uh, you know, the CTI team is publishing to a level of detail that an individual operator can go, oh snap, that's me, right? Um, right. Will we not assess that, that those around them would also be in the similar situation and be like, oh, that's Jake. Right? Exactly. Um, it, well, does that change? Let me ask you: Does that does that fundamentally change the game? Right? Would the government then not also act in the same in the same manner? Or are you saying here because it would because it really wouldn't limit their? I, I think for this particular scenario, when we're talking about you know affecting their quality of life and so mm -hmm. forth, it's like okay, well, charges aren't going to be brought, so they aren't worried about traveling to intermediate country mm -hmm. and getting extradited or so forth, but. It certainly might affect them in some regards in terms of, you know, the government saying, okay, well, you're going back to working in a rice field. That so is, it might have that sort of quality of life issue on them, but it's not going – I think the, the quality of life impact is probably going to be a lot less. And honestly, anyone who's technically skilled, the government's probably not going to say, you know, go back and work in a rice field. It's going to be, okay, you're no longer doing this super cool job. You get to go service routers now. <laughs> that, that's actually quite fascinating, right? I hadn't really considered the whole, like, you know, calling it out to a degree that the government can see who it is, that they can see who they are, but not necessarily, because uh, in that particular scenario, then, you know, you don't end up with charges being filed. That, that's fascinating. I honestly had never just, never really uh, conceived of that before. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Bring it to that level now, ma'am. If we bring it down to that level, um, what's good is we might affect change in that group to change their tactics. So we might actually more actively meet our goal if they can self-identify, crap, that was us, maybe if it's to a group within a nation state organization as opposed to the individual, because now we're talking about district level, maybe everybody's in the same vicinity, or maybe everybody's coming out of the same building, we don't know who, but we, can, we can't punish the whole group, we need them to do work, but we can force them to change their tactics. Yeah, so, so the uh, the thought there just kind of memorialized this in the uh, you know microphone feed and everything is that no, you're all good. Um, so the uh, ma'am, you're all good. Um, but the uh, so uh, basically uh, the thought process there being that uh, by identifying this individual without naming them, right, uh, we may force a group to change tactics, right? It is such a strong and in fact we've seen this, and I, I think this is where you're going with this. We've seen this repeatedly when we when we out an individual in a group that that entire group does change tactics, right? Um, it, it's it's very clear to let's say the group is is 30 people. And we charge three of them because those are the three that we can say these folks were behind the keyboard. The other 27 in the group don't just go, they're not on to me now, right? They, they absolutely are, are I, I, I would suspect, uh, pooping bricks, right? Um, is probably the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the right term there. Um, and, and certainly looking at uh, what impact do they have, right? So I, I agree with you. I, I think that you're, you're onto something there that uh, definitely, and, and certainly our pattern in the past has been, again, they charge or uh, recharge an operator. Um, you know, the rest of the group changes tactics, changes infrastructure, changes, uh, you know, changes malware in many cases, right? Or, or tools, however you want to refer to that. Um, and so I, I think to your point, I think that uh, you know identifying without naming uh, could, could be effective in achieving that same goal. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts for you, sir? I was just thinking in response to that, but you have to weigh the risk that maybe they change to something yet that you can't detect. Yeah, so, so the uh, question is, what if they, uh, what's the risk if they change to something we can't detect? And, and actually, if you, if you really want to read up on this, uh, Mandiant's APT1 report is, is outstanding. They have a whole section in there about why did we decide to publish. And uh, Kevin Mandia, um, you know, is, is somebody who uh, took, took a lot of, a lot of uh, pains in, in making sure that uh, they published about a group that, you know, and in fact, uh, this wasn't the only group they could publish about. It was one of the, wasn't the most impactful group that they could publish about. Um, if you read their reporting, they, they say specifically they chose to report on APT1 to get the word out that China was performing nation state hacking against commercial organizations, right? Uh, they wanted to tell that story, but they chose this group of many Chinese groups doing the same thing 
specifically because A, their OPSEC was horrible, um, and, and B, um, they didn't have good tooling resources, right? And so to reconstitute that group, right, was going to be very difficult, um, and they expected that they would uh, make a number of operational security mistakes in doing so, and that they would reacquire that group very, very quickly. And so they, you know, I've spoken to folks on the back end, you know, obviously for ND8, and I'm not going to reveal any details beyond the, you know, the, the generic here, but they had several other groups that they had single instance indicators for, right? Meaning like this is the one way we can track this group or two ways we can track this group and to go discuss even the operations that they were doing, even without revealing the indicators, right, would absolutely tell that group that they needed to go change TTPs, right? And so uh, basically this becomes an Intel gain loss scenario, right? So, so what, do we, what do we gain versus what do we predict we'll lose? And there certainly is an ethical issue there, um, you know, in, in that disclosure. That, that's really not one that I was that I've got a slide to talk about, but no, but that, that's great. That's why we do the discussion side on this. Uh, I think that's a phenomenal, uh, you know, phenomenal piece, right? When you publish, in fact, I'll tell you that when uh, when the APT one report came out, I know several companies who didn't have the capabilities that Mandiant did, right? Uh, Mandiant reacquired APT one like that. I mean, it was just like that because they they went to ground for mm, give or take six weeks doing some retooling and pop back up on the grid, and uh, it was just, I mean, that they they were bad at. It. There's other companies that don't have the telemetry and the resourcing the Mandiant does, and it took some of those other companies, you know, six months to a year to reacquire, you know, basically reacquire the actors, and they're, they're no longer tracked under APT1, but it's the same actors uh, continuing to operate, right, to, to reacquire them uh, obviously took longer, and so you have now a question from an ethical standpoint, I think, to where you're getting to is, if, if you release that data and you impact others' ability, right, to, to track that, is that even ethical to do? Actually, this would be a great time to do one of those polls. We have those cards, the, the, the card thing here, the ethical or unethical, so if you know that by releasing this data, you're going to change policy, but at the same time, when you release the attribution report, you're going to hurt other private businesses' ability to track the same group. Is it ethical to release and get the foreign policy debate going? So ethical would be release and get the foreign policy debate going. Unethical is you're hurting other companies and other uh, organizations and other countries' ability to track this actor that you know they're targeting a wide range of folks. Ethical or unethical? What do we think? Ooh, the ethicals have it by a large margin. Large margin, right? Um, yeah. I saw one, two, saw three. Yeah, I'd love to hear an unethical. Uh, unethical. Why do you think it was unethical? Anybody? I don't. I don't see because I don't see any reason that you couldn't like release it internally before attributing. That's the only reason. I know it's kind of a cop out, but it seems like real easy to say. Listen, everybody. This is what we're gonna do, and then next day or whatever, or in two days we're gonna release this, you know, externally. I don't see any reason to jump the gun early. I know it's a little bit of a cop out, but that, that might not be the uh, spirit of the question. Yeah, so you think timing plays an issue or plays a role here, right? So timing, so basically if, if you could give a heads up, I, I would argue just, just in the APT1 report, and, and this is so great that this is actually a concrete versus a hypothetical, right? In, in that particular case, that they did actually influence, um, you know, uh, definitely influenced uh, statecraft, influenced, uh, you know, diplomatic policy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel like, uh, I'm going to have to be very careful how I say this here. Um, I think it was publicly reported that, uh, uh, that uh, some of the intelligence services had been uh, broadcasting some of the same stuff in the APT1 report to our lawmakers for years um, and, and hadn't really moved the ball, but, but it being public did move the ball, right? Because suddenly it, was, it wasn't was something happening behind closed doors, it was something that they were getting calls, our, our elected representatives were getting calls from their constituents about. So, I mean, the timing I think plays one role, but, but also, I mean, demonstrably in this case, that moved the ball. Right. So again, whether or not it was ethical to do is a whole, a whole separate question, right? But it definitely moved the ball, right? I'll say why I said it was unethical. I think it's irresponsible to not consider uh, the potential um, intelligence and threat uh, relations being hosted by other nations when one nation is unilaterally deciding to make that decision. Yeah, so, so what you have here effectively is one nation unilaterally making a decision, um, possibly without considering, and this wasn't even a nation making a decision, it's a corporation right. making a decision but without... But that affects nations, right? A corporation making a decision that affects national policy of other nations, nations that they're not headquartered in, right? So um, basically, uh, you know, you said it was unethical to consider. Can I ask you, do you believe that, that that was a consideration that was played out? I think in this instance it was. I think in the question it wasn't. Okay, yeah, and the question, you're correct, right? So in the question, that's not something we stipulate, but you do believe in the, in the APT1 report that was something that was actually considered, you believe? Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's get Perfect. back to using the microphone if we can. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, because I'm ending up repeating stuff to yeah, get posterity. Away from it. 
Yeah, totally, because I've got, yeah. Um, okay, hey, I appreciate that. Thank you, Shane. So, so just down. kind of in response to that, but that, that, does that put you in the loop then of you can never release until you talk to enough other people that you possibly create it getting out before you have any control of it? Because once two people know something, now three people know something. Consideration is very different than making the choice and making the decision. Um, and I believe at the point that you potentially have the level of attribution that was done in APT1 that you specifically know what other nations may be using that as intelligence gathering. Fascinating thought. I like that. Sir? So as I've been thinking about this, um, I think there is an ethical ob obligation to report, but I don't think publicly. So I think... <laughs> I, I think that one of the challenges that we, especially is, is we look at this scenario as, uh, as an individual. Um, the individual shouldn't, it would be very difficult for an individual to get to the confidence level required to do a public disclosure. Um, so. Okay, so, so it looks like uh, public versus non-public disclosure uh, matters, uh, matters a lot in this scenario, right? So I, I don't disagree with that necessarily, right? Uh, although in many cases, uh, you know, like this, uh, again, the impact that they get out of the statecraft really comes because it's public, right? So we've certainly seen that play out over several, uh, over several scenarios. So, so I'd like to kind of kick over another scenario here, and this one's very related to the previous scenario, um, except here we're not impacting an individual's quality of life um, we know for certain, right? And of course, I know knowing for certain is very difficult here. But but let's suppose for the statement, or sorry, for the purpose of the of the discussion here, that we know for certain um, that uh, attribution. Uh, once we provide it, they are going to be arrested and will likely serve a lengthy prison sentence in a country that is not their home country. Right now, where are we at on the ethics? Right? Does this change the? Uh, does this change our reporting? And if so, our ethical obligations are reporting. If so, how? Any thoughts on this? Because I certainly have some, but I'd rather hear yours first. Right. So one of my thoughts would be, um, how did this person get into that role? Was it uh, a decision they made, or was it a decision that the state actor said, you're going to come work for us? Mm -hmm. so, so it sounds like personal choice actually plays a role here, right? Uh, if, if it comes down, to, uh, comes down to that. Any other thoughts about this? I get in first, and then. What did they do? So you're asking, what did they do specifically? Yeah, that, that's another great question, right? So what did they do? Uh, was there loss of life uh, there? Uh, was it loss of money, right? So yeah, totally. What did they do? I think that's an important ethical consideration. Sir? Yeah, I, I was thinking along the lines of that, and the, the confidence question becomes a lot more important that, you know, perhaps having them arrested and serve a lengthy sense in, sentence is the end goal, but in a lot of countries, that we're dealing with, they don't have the same sort of due process that we do, say, in the United States or numerous other countries where such attribution might be performed. So, you know, essentially we would be kind of trying them in abstantia yes. before you want to put out that sort of uh, uh, report because, you know, that goes to the confidence. Do you have the same level of confidence? knowing that that's going to be the result to say that yes if they were here in front of us right now we could charge them and prosecute them convict them with that sort of end result right. yeah so so that that's perfect you hit the nail on the head this is actually the point that we uh, so so all these scenarios we, we played out uh, my company uh, before you know obviously before coming out here talked to a lot of the folks there I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you that the majority of the folks that work for me are former intelligence professionals uh, most of them are, are operations uh, professionals right who have been in the field or on the other side of the keyboard um, and uh, that was one of the one of the first things that we hit on right was the uh, that we have due process and most other countries do not right so so that was one of the first things we hit on from an ethical standpoint the second thing that they hit on that my analysts hit on very very quickly is that uh, when it comes to the gold standard of, of cyber attribution right uh, it, it's it's really the, the the five eyes nations right um, so five eyes being US uh, Canada uh, Great Britain Australia New Zealand right um, basically the five eyes countries really are considered worldwide kind of that gold standard for intelligence and attribution um, if we publish something does that 
de facto, uh, you know, basically try and convict said individual, right? Um, obviously, we're not going to share the information behind that, uh, you know, all the source data behind that attribution, right? So our confidence level in that attribution will never be discussed. The actual source evidence is not going to be discussed. But the fact that we made a publication is absolutely going to get brought up in, in foreign, uh, basically in foreign kangaroo court, right, is, is what ends up being in, in many, many nations, right? Um, and so that, that was one of the things that we looked at very, very heavily was who's making the attribution, right? Um, and then also, uh, basically, you know, from our perspective, if it's if it's the government of Morocco making an attribution right against a U.S. operator, I'm not that worried about that, right? Ethically, right? If it's the government, on the other hand, uh, you know, the U.S. government making an attribution about, let's say, a, a Saudi operator, um, I am concerned about that, right? I'm, I'm concerned. Well. They take Saudi out. They have a horrible human rights uh, background. Let's pick a, a country that doesn't. Uh, a French operator, right? I, I'm less. Uh, I'm still a little bit more worried about that than than you know Morocco coming to the U.S. side, right? Uh, U.S. Uh, you know basically indicting more or less a French operator. I think changes the game quite a bit there because again that that report is doubtlessly going to be read into the uh, the court record. And, and even France is a bad example because they at least have a decent legal system. But you get the idea there. And, and, and 100%, that's exactly where we went with this, right? So so I do think that there's some significant challenges there. And, and thank you so much for bringing that point up because, like I said, that, that was our conclusion as well. Uh, we don't have any answers, by the way. It's not like there's a good ethical framework where I can go, here's where you publish, here's where you don't, right? And to somebody's point earlier, there really is that delta between the me working as an operator, me working as an individual versus uh, somebody else saying, uh, you know, basically the, the government, you know, in, in conglomerate, uh, basically making a determination there. Uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll share with you that, uh, that that's something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I left the intelligence community after 18 years uh, based on something I saw that I wasn't comfortable with that I'm positive that we're still doing, right? Um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not a whistleblower. I'm not going to go blow a whistle on anything, but I made, made a personal choice not to be involved with said activity, right? Um, and uh, uh, obviously, we'll not discuss any of that any further because all that. But, but again, you know, firsthand, I can tell you that uh, you know, nation state versus individual does change the game quite a bit, right? Individually, we all have to determine: are we comfortable in being involved with, with whatever that happens to be? In this particular case that we're talking about here, cyber attribution, sir. Um, it, the more I think about it, uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to reach like an axiomatic conclusion that it's always, you know, in this situation we do this and in that situation we do this and it may be taken for granted for, for the rest of the conversations when I think about it that it does really depend on what we're talking about because in a situation of armed conflict, we don't wait and try the person on the other trench. Right. You know, we, we, we do what, we're, what the troops were sent out there to do. And if we're talking about cyber, you know, warfare on um, either a state level mm -hmm. or, you know, or whatever, um, I think it really does have to take into consideration what the consequences are of, because it may be an exam a situation where releasing the name may set an example as to what's going to happen to other people who do have personal choice. So. That's a great. If you'll stay there for just a second, I'm interested to know, uh, since you brought up the term cyber warfare, um, d is it different when it's cyber espionage versus cyber warfare, and when do we cross the line from one to the other? Absolutely. I don't have an answer to that. It's a good okay. question. Well, does anybody have an answer to that question? Because I think that, please come up to the mic, because I think this is an important discussion to have as we talk about, because I am actually going to hit warfare here in a minute, um, and uh, this is an important discussion to have. When does it cross that line? All right. So. Espionage is, is stealing information, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Property, intellectual property. When you talk about warfare, you're talking about when you say, because everybody uses the term cyber attack. Yep. It's not an attack. When you attack some, somebody or something, you're destroying things or killing people or hurting them. Yep. Espionage, even though you may lose money, nobody's dying in the trenches on the battlefields. And so we use this term cyber attack in, this, in, in these communities uh, writ large, and we gotta understand that, that cyber warfare and cyber attacks are completely different than, you talk about the Shamoon virus destroying mm -hmm. 30,000 computers and we have a hardware issue and that's hurting a company, that's actually destroying something versus stealing property of, of, a, of a government or a, of a corporation. You still lose money, but you're, you, those effects are reversible. You are collecting versus hurting or destruction. Yeah, so, so if I may, I'd like to, before you leave the mic there, real quick, um, so I'd like to talk real quick about the Day's March Doctrine, right? So, because we talked about, you know, the, the point of destroying something, right? That's a cyber attack, just to make sure that I'm, I'm tracking with you, but prior to that, we're, we're not. Is that where you're at? Well, there's, there's a range, right? There's you a range. Have, you have espionage, you have mm -hmm. disruption, DDoS, you yep. have, you know, you have, uh, you know, these different uh, ways to manipulate things and integrity of messages, but then finally, you get to that far spectrum of actually death, destruction, 
Yeah. So, so I guess what I would what I would question then is, uh, <clears throat> let's say pre-positioning, right? Because if we roll all the way back to, in order for you to go to destroy assets, Shamoon virus being a, a great example there, I don't think anybody argues that, that wasn't a cyber attack, right? Um, it definitely impacted Saudi Aramco in a huge, huge way, huge way. Um, but uh, so as we look at that, there there's pre-positioning that occurred, right? Um, you know, they couldn't just snap their fingers and say go. They had to be in the network. They had to be in the right places in the network to to achieve that effect. Um, when do we cross the line? Because as we look at, you know, I go back to medieval times, right? And uh, we look at uh, the day's march doctrine, right? It wasn't that you could go attack somebody that wasn't attacking you yet, but you didn't have to wait for them. Basically, the, the kind of the rule of the nobles, as it were, was you didn't literally have to wait for the enemy to be at the gates, knocking the gate down. If they were marching an army and bringing an army and they were day's march away, right? Then it was considered ethically okay to go out and deploy your own army forward. And so, the, you know, basically fight on, not directly on our, you know, basically on our capital castle grounds kind of idea. Um, I kind of step back and I look at the pre-positioning and kind of putting it in that light. I, I wonder where does where does it become that act of war or so, act of war and, back and, up the attack? Dealing, yeah. Now we're dealing with this, this, this term called sovereignty. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about does does you being in my country uh, it, it, or, or less worst case scenario is you're taking advantage of another country's uh, uh, servers and things and doing operations out of that country, knowing that if you want to get after them, you are going into another country space that's not trying to do any of these things. They're just you're just leasing their equipment or whatever else. It's an issue that's hard to deal with in this day and age because we've dealt with for, for centuries yep. sovereignty. This is my physical territory. Same thing with air. Same thing with space and these other domains. So yep. now we have this hard issue trying to really understand what, what is it, external internal sovereignty. And what does that look like? Yeah, I de definitely agree there. Um, can you do the mic? Yeah, yeah they're going to. Yeah, sorry. Just just for posterity. Right. So, so now you're talking about the difference, though, between reconnaissance yep. and pre-positioning a payload. Those are two very different things. If I've actually planted a weapon, that's an active attack, mm -hmm. whether I've executed it or not. Reconnaissance, I haven't done anything physically, I haven't pre-positioned any weapons, and that's part of intel gathering. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, I'll, I'll counter just by mentioning that, uh, and I do agree with you, by the way, that the second you, that you position a weapon, whether or not you've executed or actually detonated said weapon, um, I, I think you've crossed the line into a cyber attack. And, and again, as we're talking about attack here, right, we're talking about impact of, you know, basically what's a cyber attack versus espionage, because we're talking about the action here, just kind of get you know, spinning all the way around back here, but but the if I have a back door on a machine, um, the delta between me positioning a weapon there and not, which I think we both agree crosses that line, literally is is upload, right? And, and so basically, as we talk about a back door, that could be reconnaissance or it could be staging for me to go upload that weapon. And so it, may, it does make it very difficult. And back to the point of sovereignty, I mean, it really is a it really is a difficult thing to, to track, ma'am. And if you're talking about um, at which point can you act? if the day's march really comes in there, especially when the espionage is a setup not for a cyber attack of destruction, but a kinetic attack. And if we think about the setups that needed to happen um, in Georgistan. Uh, to <laughs> in Georgistan, I love it. Um, where you had, in, you know, integrations of ICS networks to disable electricity to allow kinetic warfare to take place at a time when there was no anyone knowing and using social dis you know, disruptions um, that were happening for the rest of the world to be distracted for your timing. There is bigger issues there in terms of at what point is it okay to treat it as an act of warfare when you know the attribution and you're quite certain that the end goal may not be to harm the servers you're on, yep. but to position yourself for kinetic physical warfare. So, so if I take this correctly, your, your stance is that the ethics of this change based on the type of espionage and what is the espionage ultimate goal, right? If it's to steal intellectual property, the ethics change differently than if the espionage is to gather intelligence to support a future kinetic act. Correct. Okay, good to go. At the mic. So I, to that point and to the earlier point of uh, cyber kinetic events being like a trigger that would change your, your mm -hmm. opinion here, I kind of want to maybe push back against the idea that just stealing IP cannot have a serious true real life effect and that when people lose millions of dollars, those millions of dollars would have gone to people who now aren't affording medicine or going to college. Like it, it does trickle down into a real life effect 
it, yep. not just explosions. Yeah, so, so that's that's such a great point, right? Uh, we actually worked an instant response earlier this year uh, for a company that uh, got hit by ransomware, um, and it was financial, it's straight financial motivation. There's no, we're, we have solid attribution on the, as solid as attribution gets here. Foot and mouth, right? But as solid as attribution gets, we've got good attribution on this group. But uh, you know, literally, the company got hit on Wednesday. They lost one of their major contracts on Friday, um, and uh, they were told literally that uh, they would lose the next one if they weren't operational on Monday, right? And they, they were going to have seventy people out of a job, right? And so you're looking at seventy people then that uh, are going on government assistance, right? Uh, definitely impactful to their lives, uh, you know, losing jobs, and and so yeah, to that point, right? Just stealing, uh, just stealing intellectual property. We, we've seen other places where folks have have lost jobs uh, based on, you know, moving uh, manufacturing overseas, right? Uh, so, so, yeah, definitely there, there's no such thing as, I, I think to your point, right, there's no such thing as just stealing intellectual property. There is a, a human impact to that no matter what. Sir? I was just going to mention that risk management also uh, assumes a specific dollar amount to a life. And so that's uh, one of the challenges that... Uh, <laughs> wow, uh, flashing the unethical card there, but, but uh, well, not him. I mean, just no, the yeah, thought. The concept, the concept, yeah. Not yeah. Well, but it, it it is a challenge because you are affecting so many other people when you are taking away from the economy. That is a, that is a type of disruption. Um, uh, so, but but the other thing too is the difference between espionage and warfare is really the what the person's intent is, and it, it's really hard to judge intent. In fact. You, you could cause death by trying to do espionage and making a mistake. So. Yeah, so uh, you know, to that point of causing, <laughs> uh, causing death by, uh, you know, by hitting uh, espionage there, uh, or trying to do espionage, um, you know, we, we talk about intent a lot as we do incident response, and um, you know, I'll share an example that we ran into uh, you know, where intent and impact were not identical, right? Uh, you know, we, we saw an Oracle server fall over, um, which I guess is pretty normal for them, but uh, we saw an Oracle server fall over that was part of an ERP, um, and uh, they were in the middle of, or very end stage, of a, a very large bid that was literally going to keep this, this company alive, right? This company is, is on the verge of 5,000 plus people um, and, and getting ready literally to, uh, they, they will be by the end of the year less than 1,000 people if this bid doesn't go through, if they don't win this bid. Um, and they're down to the end stages of getting this thing in and their Oracle server that drives their, their ERP system, Enterprise Resource Planning System, fell over. Um, and they were just positive. It was a competitor trying to take them out of the game, right? And uh, and then they found out that indeed the server was hacked, and then they were doubly certain that uh, that or it was definitely they were trying to take them out of the game. And and it ends up being that uh, the attacker had been on there for months and had been siphoning data off. And specific to this bid, it was definitely corporate espionage. I say definitely as definite as we can be. It appeared to be corporate espionage, um, but we, we were able to go back and track through some of the logs and see that the attacker was indeed doing queries to support that type of data. All right, so it's the type of data they would want to go steal for espionage points. When the server finally fell over, it's because the attacker executed a left inner join, um, exhausting lots of RAM. And if you've ever worked on an Oracle server, when you exhaust all the RAM, <sighs> bad things happen. The ERP system, on the other hand, had guardrails, right? So if you were querying through the ERP system, the actual middleware and not the back end tier, um, you couldn't do that, right? It had guardrails there, and, and they, from their access, had taken all the training wheels off, right, effectively. And, and, and we looked at the last query that was run, Last query was ever run before rebuilding the server, uh, but the uh, well, because you know those things fall over, integrity becomes an issue there too. And this was a very, very seismic event for the organization. And by the way, uh, you know, for for whatever it's worth, uh, they did not win that bid. Um, they they absolutely lost that bid, and, and several thousand people went out of work. Right, um, and so that's a great example of a, an operation that began with an intent for espionage. Now. I kind of look at that one. That one's a little bit weird, right? Because had the espionage succeeded, the outcome would have been the same, right? So, so espionage versus the actual impact, right? The 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 end stage impact, what was ultimately the same? Those thousands of people lost jobs, but but at the end of the day, I mean, it is definitely a, a great case of intent not not aligning with impact or impact not aligning with intent, right? So, sir, come on up to the mic, unless you want to be anonymous, in which case he'll have to. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, there uh, you go. So, so one thing about these ethical questions, a lot of times we focus on intent and focus on our actual actions, decisions, but I'm old enough to remember back in the days when people were talking about nuclear war strategies mm -hmm. that there is another factor here that we have to consider, and that is the perspective of the other side. If you conduct a successful espionage attack and they, or espionage action and they detect that, they may not interpret that as purely an espionage piece. Uh, action and then they may react in a way that is uh, that will create a larger downstream issues that um, 
you won't be able to control them. And so I do think that that's uh, ethical to mention that has to be considered in these questions because, again, sometimes ethics we think of more just about us internally, but not seeing those downstream impacts, particularly on the basis of the perspective of the targets. No, I like that. So, so if I can paraphrase here, what you're saying is that your intent probably matters less than the assessed intent of the victim? Yeah. I like that. that that's, uh, that's definitely significant, right? Because we've said, from a U.S. doctrine standpoint, very publicly, we've said that we would consider uh, pre-positioning in the electric grid uh, to be a, a catalyst for kinetic action. Right? And we've been very public about that, right? That, uh, you know, that if, if Russia were to pre-position, I mean, Russia, here I am. <laughs> It's almost, it's almost like I'm trying to drink polonium tea or something. But the, uh, the, in any case, um, so we have the, uh, basically, if you've got this, this group, right, um, who's hacking the electric grid, looking to do something like they did in Ukrainistan, um, we've just flat out said, right, if, if we see you positioning there, right, that, that that itself would possibly be cause for kinetic action. And I think that's significant, right, because, um, you know, there's legitimate reasons you'd want to be in the same spots for es purely espionage reasons, right, to understand, uh, you know, wh how much electric power is going to one place or that that's really interesting you, I mean do you have any other like like first order or like examples of where that might I know the power grid is the big one I think of any other examples of places where that might go awry your intent versus assessed intent mm. uh, again I, I read a lot of military history so I only think of it from those perspectives and, and I do remember part of the issue in the nuclear war issue war kind of discussions were being very public about what your overall intent was and how you would react in a variety of scenarios. And then that, that would help reinforce the mutually exerted destruction concept. And so I think that that would have some parallels here where, particularly where an attribution is not always going to be a precise science, mm -hmm. and some of the impacts are not going to be life-threatening, we want to make sure we're clear about what the lines are before we you know, institute a policy that might um, you know, hurt other people down the road. Yep. So fascinatingly, thank you very much for that specifically, because fascinatingly, that, that's why I'm here actually, right, talking about this is because we have not communicated uh, about, you know, as we create an impact, right, by, by doing this attribution, we've not talked about it at a government level uh, and projected it at a government level like we used to, again, using the nuclear example, saying if X, then Y, right? Um, we, we haven't done that here, and, and that's going to be a significant, I think, is going to be a significant issue going down the road. Say, say that again. So we haven't communicated uh, at, a, at a government policy level where we've said if, very, very publicly saying, if you do X, then this is the outcome, that this is going to be the, uh, you know, basically that, that, that public outcome. That, that is not your statement. You, you disagree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think in like 2015, 2014, when, when President Obama went over and talked to President Xi about the fact that when they were getting into these industrial control systems, mm -hmm. they're saying, hey, look, these systems are not built to, to be pinged these systems are not built, built to be pinged a thousand times a second, and these systems are 1960s, 70s, 80s technology. Mm. So your intent is to, to create espionage, to create a, a vulnerability for our in getting new power grids, water treatment plants, whatever. Mm -hmm. When you, with your, we don't know your intent, but when you actually destroy the power grid in North Dakota right. and kill 100,000 my my civilians, yep. I'm going to react to a whole government approach, even though you meant something for 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 yep. espionage reasons. We're going to do a kinetic and whole government approach to this, so we have addressed these issues where it was meant to be espionage, but we realize second, third order effects are going to be something that's going to hurt our, our civilians. And we both agreed that we would guard how we do intellectual property espionage, how we do military targeting, those kind of things. And that, that was done just a few years ago. Well, I don't disagree that it was done. I obviously don't disagree that it was done in, in that very specific circumstance. But, and, and also in a more generic circumstance, we've been very public about the fact that, that we won't tolerate intrusions into the grid. Um, but but I, I don't necessarily agree with the fact that I think that we've more broadly, not, not the way that we have with, it's, there, there are very clear lines. Like, for instance, uh, we, we know from a sovereignty perspective that if you bring a warship inside, uh, you know, outside of international waters into U.S. waters, that there's, there's going to be a reaction. And that reaction has been very well telegraphed, what that's going to be. Um, and I don't think we've done that to a larger extent with, with cyber. I, I just, I think that that's, uh, I think we've done it on in individual cases, right? And again, the, the grid is such a great example of that. And, you know, you came back to that one as well. Um, I think even on the intellectual property side, even though we telegraphed to China, China quite a bit. I, I don't know that that was a, I, I think it was a very, very specific, like, hey, let's tone it down a little bit kind of thing. But but obviously, if you're working instant response today, you're seeing Chinese actors still stealing intellectual property, 
every day of the week, right? Okay. And so, yeah. Who is the one person that's been arrested in this whole situation? Chinese actor went to Belgium to steal uh, mil military uh, yep. property, gets extradited to the United States, yes, sir. and he is going to court. Yeah, so and it wasn't about military, uh, uh, actually military right. property, it was about economic Right, about sending that message, right? Yeah. About the economic message. So yeah, to so that point, the uh, the one person thus far has been arrested, charged, whatever, um, is the, well, arrested, I shouldn't say charged, because there's a lot of them that have been charged. The one that's been arrested and extradited is a gentleman uh, in Belgium that was arrested in Belgium. I said gentleman, the spy in Belgium um, who was stealing military technology, right, there, uh, who was ultimately arrested and then extradited back, right? And it's, yeah, absolutely. Ma'am. I think we still need to think about the ethics of the trust in publishing. Uh, because of the potential of intentional misattribution and the fact that um, people don't always know what they don't know. And we're talking about the gold standard potentially of five eyes producing, but we need to consider uh, when what is the ethics of, an, of a third party country to take an action based on analysis when there might have been intentional misattribution and is there secondary verification before acting? Which I know now we're talking about the third party instead of the first versus the second. Sure. But I think it's um, critical that we contemplate that when we do our publishing. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So, yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's a good point. Sir. So, um, <clears throat> we kind of hit the... Um, it matters what intent was, mm -hmm. but it also matters what the consequences of that intent was and how that intent was interpreted. And there's a third part to this kind of ethical uh, triad here, and the third one is, is why. So if our intent was espionage and we ended up killing 100 people, why did we do it? Did we do it in self-defense? Or did we do it as an act of aggression? Did we do it out of greed? Or did we do it out of fear? Or why did we do it? And so it's kind of a question for you and for the crowd is, is, is does that matter? Um, or is it purely, are we purely going to say the, you know, it's a matter of the consequence? Well, what if it was for incompetence? <laughs> <laughs> then you would, it would really depend what the consequences are. Because, yeah. I mean, that certainly is a thing, right? I mean, certainly, and thank you very much for that, right? Because the, the why question is something we really haven't talked about yet, right? Was it for self-defense? And when you talk about self-defense, I think there's another critical thing to think about as well here, and that's perceived self-defense, right? Um, your perception that you have to take this action to defend yourself, obviously, uh, can change that game as well. I Sir? Oh, please, by all means. So you mentioned that uh, we had stated a policy that uh, if we found f for you know if we found Russia in our substations that we would react. Yep. Uh, we didn't because we found them in a hundred substations as reported in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so my question is: Last year we had someone in here that was advocating for a United States level hack back policy to create a. Um, how did he phrase it? The nuclear deterrent for hacking and that we currently had no consequences for the countries that were attacking us regularly. So what are the ethical ramifications of that? Well, so, so I'm, yeah, that's a great, uh, look, hacking back is something that comes up all the time, right? Um, by far, the best research that's been done on this, thank you, by the way, for that, because it's, it's a fascinating side of the discussion. Um, the, the best, by far, the best uh, publication or best research done on this, this topic really comes out of Naval Postgraduate School. Um, they've done a lot of work on, uh, they've done a lot of public work. Some of it's classified, most of it is not, um, on, uh, or at least most of what I'm aware of is not, at least, um, on the, uh, basically, on cyber attribution, cyber deterrence, right? And, and the thing that you will see consistently as we look at cyber deterrence um, is that people consistently will talk about the issues with attribution playing into the deterrence overall, right? Because again, if, if your attribution isn't solid, um, you can't deter. Unlike, you know, if somebody launches a missile, right? If we're talking about com coming back to the nuclear side, right? If we're coming back to the nuclear side and we're talking about a uh, basically a missile being launched at, uh, you know, a foreign government, there's no, qu or foreign nation, there's no question about where it came from. We have the technology at this point, right, to see where indeed that uh, that missile was launched from. Uh, so I think that that does play in hugely there. I think that our ability to do good attribution and have good confident attribution, I don't have a definition for what, quote, good confident attribution means, but, but at the point that we're ready to do that, I think that's where we can start getting into deterrence. Because you are right, we did find them in substations and, and then said, yeah, but we're not going to we're not going to shoot, right? We're not going to take kinetic action yet. Um, I, I know we did a little bit of 
political posturing perhaps, but but a little bit less there. Um, ultimately, I, I think, and, and call this for whatever it's worth, but the majority of those that they found them in were um, uh, basically were the end distribution substations, not the transmission substations. Um, and so just on, I'll keep, try to stay out of the tech here for a second, but the um, the difference between the two Ukraine attacks, uh, Ukraine attack number one that impacted a much smaller number of people um, hit, I believe if I remember correctly, 70 different uh, transmission, or sorry, distribution substations. So the end, that basically distribute the power out to uh, out to your businesses and factories and, and homes. Um, and then the uh, second attack that hit a much, much larger number of people hit transmission substations, right? Uh, and in fact, they had written the malware, at least according to uh, Dregos and ESET, um, had written that malware specifically to operate at the transmission substation layer, uh, talk those protocols, and, and again, we're talking about a higher level here. That's where you see the big, you know, high tension lines, and anyway, um, so, so hit a much larger number of people, and I, I think that may have been the delta um, in our particular case. Well, I don't know, and I don't know ethically, right, if you're not ready to, basically, if they're not in a position to create a monstrous impact, a monumental impact kind of thing. Um, you know, does that change the ethics of it of it overall? And I, I, I don't know at the end of the day, but that's such a great point. You know, we did say that we were gonna act. We didn't really act, um, but, but I wonder if the cop, personally, I wonder if the cop out there for us was like, well, it wasn't transmission, so we're okay. I, I, I don't know, I don't know. But again, the two Ukraine attacks, that's what separated the two, was, was distribution versus transmission, right? So I'll go ahead and hop up to the next uh, next point. Oh, did you have a thought? Do you want to? Okay, hop up to the next point here. Um, I'm actually going to skip this one here because it's an operator being uh, being killed. But we're time wise, there's a couple of more important discussions that I'd like to like to have here, uh, rather than kind of variation of last scenario. And, and I'd like to uh, how appropriate. I'd love to talk about the National Power Grid. It was impacted by a cyber attack. Power was interrupted. There was no loss of life directly attributed to the event. Right? So nobody at this point has been, been identified as having loss of life. Um, but when we publish that cyber attribution, national leaders are going to box them to go into war, and they're going to kill hundreds of thousands of, of people in the aggressing country. Um, ethically, at the, well, we were going here no matter what, right? Um, ethically, uh, where, where are we at on this? Is publishing an attribution where we know the impact is going to be actual kinetic event where we are going to kill, and I intentionally throw up here a large number of people dying, right? Um, and, and I think that's that's important because when we go to war, we, we just don't know, right? Uh, if you look at some of the FOIA reports for the, uh, or some of the stuff that was FOIA'd, uh, you know, going into the uh, the second Gulf War, we, we thought we were losing, uh, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, the FOIA report that I saw said they shipped more than 10,000 body bags over there, uh, you know, for going into, basically going into our, our second Gulf War, right? Obviously, that didn't happen. Thank goodness that didn't happen, right? Um, but uh, we were prepared for that, right? And that, that's not on the Iraqi side either. Obviously, if the Iraqi, you know, if we suffered 10,000 10, plus casualties, uh, you can imagine uh, what, what that would have looked like on their side. Not that it was great for them and that they're living the dream over there now anyway, but, but again, uh, you know, separate issue there. If we're killing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, um, you know, do we... If there was no loss of life on our side, are we as an individual analyst, and this is really where I'd like to kind of think about this for a second here, as an individual analyst, you know when you publish this attribution that you're killing people, we're gonna create a war, I say create a war, we're going to box our leaders in to go to war, are you ethically, let's take a poll here actually before we get into the details of this, uh, you know that by publishing this, you're confident in your attribution, are you ethical or unethical in publishing your attribution if you know that people are going to die as a result when nobody died in the precipitating event? What do we think? Ethical or unethical? Individual analysts, right? Yeah, individual analysts. Are you ethically, are you ethically responsible in, yes, yeah, so the unethicals have it here. Um, if you said ethical, I'd love to hear your thought on, on the why, All right? Do you wanna oh. mic this and stand for the mic? Is it, hit the mic if you wanna get our. Well, good. There you go. So, fire. Going to war is a team event. And, you know, sometimes, look, if you're not giving your national leaders, or whatever it is, your hierarchy, um, the best information possible, I don't think you're doing your job. <clears throat> and, you know, at some point you have to have some faith that they're going to make the right call. Yes, they might be boxed into going to war, but they might not. So why would you assume necessarily? Why would you have the arrogance, per se, right. to Ooh. assume that you I know like what's that. going to happen down the road when you give that piece of information? Ooh, I like that. You're just giving them a fact. 
Mm-hmm. It's up to them that the, the leadership, you know, the difference between a leadership and then you're just down the, like, your line people is the leadership is required. Their job is to figure out the future. Does the future mean going to the war? But they have to have accurate information to do that. And if you're not providing that, then you're not doing your job. And you might still, they might still go to war with the wrong information. Does that make that better? Against maybe the wrong people mm-hmm. doing the wrong things? And that doesn't make sense either. Assuming internal publication versus external publication. I was assuming external publication, right? Like publishing to the public versus publishing to your command. It matters. Yeah, I, oh, yeah yes, we're back to internal versus external communication. I, th- I think it does matter, and, and to that point, you could publish internal without publishing externally. Um, I, I was assuming external publication here as well. Yeah, but but I mean, I, particularly the boxing in, right? If the public opinion is, is what would generally box that in, right? But but I, I mean, it is a fascinating thought there, right? If you are not providing your leaders with the best possible information, um, are, are they going to a go to war anyway? Go to war for the wrong reasons? Go to war with the wrong people? Um, fundamentally, intelligence is a decision support service, right? Attribution, of course, is part of that decision support. Um, are we then not providing the? We're not basically the folks who are going to make decisions. One where inaction is a decision, right? Um, and so, as as they talked about at the end of the the last talk, inaction is a decision, right? So, if we uh, don't act and we don't publish, are we then making the decision to give them bad information to make other bad decisions? Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, great thought. I, yeah. The, the, the only thing I'll add to that is let's say that we didn't have their unmarked planes and nobody knew except for one guy who attacked Pearl Harbor. Nobody died in this, in this fictional Pearl mm-hmm. Harbor, but it absolutely destroyed our base. No loss of life, but one person know who did it. Would that person not be obligated to stand up and say, hey, it was Japan, everybody, or it was this person who ordered the attack? When you have a damage, you, especially to national critical infrastructure or whatever it is, that's an act of war, whether anyone died or not. And, mm-hmm. and that's why, to me, it doesn't matter whether your attribution was public or private. What you have there is an act of war, in my opinion. So, now, Can I ask, before you move away from the mic, does it change if it's not an act of war? I don't think there's there's such a thing that an attack on a national power grid is not being an act of war. Well, right. Let's slide away from the power grid for a second, though. Like if we had a if we had an attack on uh, let's say manufacturing infrastructure um, that's not critical for national defense, right? Not directly like building bombs, building uh, let's say uh, the Dixie Sugar Plant down in Savannah, Georgia gets taken offline, nobody dies, but there's a huge uh, financial impact to the area of Savannah, right? Because sugar apparently is all they'd be drinking the sweet tea. Um, you know, do you? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Anyway, um, so I'm from Georgia, by the way, so I can say that. But uh, anyway, um, or maybe not. But but does that change the game? Well, I'm from I'm from Texas, and we have something called Castle Law, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not personally I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> so. I'm not personally a big uh, big proponent of it. So I think it in in this case, um, if you didn't have full understanding of the reasons why the attack happened. Again, we talked about that. If you didn't have a full understanding of what the intent was, all you know that there is an attack on a plant, I think that that absolutely does matter and that your response should be different. Okay, so, so if your response should be different, can I ask how? <laughs> um, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, and if you yeah. don't want to answer, that's fine too. I just yeah, um, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Okay, fair good, enough. Good, good, very good uh, question. <laughs> I'm always looking for other opinions. That's why I ask, because I, I have thoughts on this as well. But yes, go ahead. Uh, so I was leaning towards ethical, but I, I feel like there's not quite enough information to make the choice, which is, so you've postulated here killing hundreds of thousands in the war, mm-hmm. understanding that's a, to, to add context, but you haven't given what happens if this attribution is not made and foreign policy continues. Right? Right. If we know that an adversary has now shown intent, what mm-hmm. is the next thing they're going to do that we would have prevented had we killed 100,000 here? Yeah. Now, that's a great question, right? And, and obviously, that's one of the problems that we consistently run into here uh, as, as we look at deterrence, right? If you don't act with deterrence uh, or if you don't, if you don't counter an aggressive act, right, today, what's the next aggressive act, right? Uh, by taking this out, right, obviously, and, and you're right, because we can't postulate it's, it's very or say we can't we do all the time from a national security standpoint but but here in the scenario it's very difficult to postulate that out but you, but you are to to that point very very correct any other thoughts on this sir so uh i actually couldn't decide ethical yeah. or unethical because I, I think 
you know, one slide is an uh, insufficient amount of context. And uh, one resource that is on my reading list that I haven't gotten to yet uh, is the, the Talon manual, which mm -hmm. is now in its second revision. How many people here are familiar with Talon? I think Not enough. Yes, one please. Hand. Yes. Right, exactly. So, uh, so the Talion manual was put together by um, a NATO associated group, you could say. Uh, so, many different NATO nations, including the U.S., contributed to this. Uh, it was people from the governments, from NGOs, and from academia uh, across public policy, legal, technical, all contributed to it to address these exact sort of issues. At, at what point does, you know, what's the line between cyber espionage and cyber war? Uh, how, do, how do cyber attacks fall into that? Where, you know, the lines between cyber events, kinetic events, that sort of thing, and provide sort of a, an overall doctrine mm -hmm. uh, for these exact sort of things. And I think to be able to make any sort, and ethics definitely plays into that uh, very heavily. And uh, so I think before trying to make a decision on that, I would want to be more informed by a framework like that to think about it. Yep. Yeah. So, so to that point, uh, if this is something that interests you, this kind of topic interests you, uh, the Talon Manual is, is definitely a good read, although it is a thick um, very dry. It is. It is not an exciting read. It, it's doctrine, right? At the end of the day, doctrine is not exciting, right? Unless you're a, a doctrine geek, in which case, whatever, right? But, sir. Uh, so I think one of the things that, like, and maybe it's getting a little too much into detail for this scenario, but um, you know, in order to attack, uh, to, and I think it is really an attack in this case, a national power grid and not kill anyone. No traffic lights were right. affected. No hospitals were affected. That is an incredibly targeted, precise attack to be able to show that you can take down a national power grid at that scale and not kill a single person. And I think that, in, uh, like to some extent, is more of a dangerous attack than killing people in a city because the traffic lights went out. You know, there's a car accident. Mm -hmm. And so that's showing that you have utmost control of their vital infrastructure and perhaps even is more important to retaliate against. I like that. So um, about Ukraine, uh, so <laughs> yes, um, it was seriously, in both of the Ukraine attacks, uh, nobody has cited, uh, you know, Ukraine hasn't come out and said, hey, here's the death toll from, from either, of these, uh, either of these grid interruptions. Um, it, there's, it's not to argue that the proximate cause, right? You mentioned, mentioned like a traffic light, right? Uh, a traffic light might have been the proximate, you know, or the uh, power outage may have been the proximate cause of a death through that. But, but again, even there, Ukraine hasn't, uh, you know, hasn't been public about any number of, I, I have a hard time, agree, again, you know, in this scenario or, or theirs even, right? But, but I'm going to roll with theirs and say that so far there's been no, uh, you know, basically no uh, claim even. And the, the deaths uh, deaths were caused there, right? and so it's a very interesting point there. And, and I think to that, <laughs> any thoughts about the Ukraine attack there? And do you think uh, you know? I, I wonder. Bring it back to the to the topic at hand. Oh, please, yeah. I wonder if it's an attribution issue, and you know the deaths weren't attributed that way because you know the, the lights went down, and so well the drivers should have responded correctly. You know the lights went down. You're supposed to turn. You know mm -hmm. always stops. It's now their fault. But was it their fault? You know, right. are we attributing the deaths there to that cyber attack, or are we falling back and saying, "Well, we don't know how to how to attribute this anymore"? Um, you know, maybe it's it's an attribution problem there. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I do a good deal of expert witness work, and, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'll mention uh, there's a term called proximate cause, right? Uh, so, for instance, I spilled my soda on you, and you ran uh, over to your hotel room, crossing the street, so that you could, you know, change, and you got run over by a car, right? You wouldn't have run across the street if you weren't soaking wet with soda, and so the pro legally the proximate cause of, of your death, right, is is me spilling soda on you, right? And so, from an attribution side, though, right, the cause of death on the coroner's certificate is going to be like he got run over by a car. Right, but the proximate cause might be different there, right? So, so misattribution versus, right? Yep. That's that's a really great, uh, really great kind of point there, right? We're not doing a good proximate cause level analysis of some of these deaths, I suspect, or impacts. It's, it's the same thing with the UK uh, ransomware a few years ago. There's been zero attribution yep. of, of all of the, the, the surgeries that didn't take place, of the people that didn't get picked yep. up to go to go to the emergency thing. Nobody's done any assessments of that at all, and that's. We talk about Ukraine as an Eastern European country. They're, they're, you know, once above the level of sticks and fire. We're talking about a British national government 
has, you know, that's, yeah. it's, a, it's a very modern, yeah. that has done zero effects of that. Yeah, so, so to memorialize that, basically WannaCry is, is what we're talking about here. The uh, you know, WannaCry attacks, obviously NHS got taken down in the UK. Uh, there's been zero attribution of death there either, and, and clearly they have the reporting infrastructure to do it. Um, they haven't been willing either based on people that didn't get picked up to go to the hospital, surgeries that didn't happen, diagnoses, et cetera. Nobody's labeled it there either. And so, yeah, I think it just solidifies the point we're doing a bad job of proximate cause level analysis. Sir? Uh, so, I apologize, I missed the first half of your talk, but I assume, okay. given this scenario, that you're an analyst of some kind if you're doing this kind mm -hmm. of work, right? So, in my mind, I would even go so far as to say, not only are you ethically bound to do the attribution, I'd say you're unethical if you don't, because the whole point of what you're doing is finding attribution and reporting it. That's the whole point. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great point there, right? So you took the job, you signed up to do the job, right? Um, if you aren't doing your job, are you ethical, are you acting ethically, right? And uh, I, I, I have big feels about that, really big feels about that, definitely. All right, yep. I, I got to counter the argument a little bit, so how about you take the exact opposite view? You were contracted to do it for a private agency, hmm? and they told you don't release it. And you were contracted, and now you've got the attribution. So wait a minute. If you're gonna, if we're gonna play the whole, you're you're bound to release it. I happen to agree with you personally, but if you're bound to release it, what if you're bound not to release and then you leak it, and then you have whistleblower laws and all that? Attribution and proximate cause don't come back to your core question of is it okay for me to cause something that kills a bunch of people? Um, right. I generally prefer not to kill a bunch of people, but if those bunch right. of people are gonna kill me, I'm gonna shoot them first. Castle law, dude, worry. Um, <laughs> it, so so that's. And just transparency, I came here because I can't answer these questions, Me and I enjoy the conversation, yeah. yes. and I thank you uh, uh, for adding this to the DEF CON type world. Uh, I have to go, but I'm really enjoying it. I appreciate so it. Thank you. I just want to say thank you on the way out. No, I appreciate that. And hey, to that point, right, uh, you know, kind of coming back uh, on, man, that was deep. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. Um, so, but yeah, coming back to that, uh, coming back to that point, though, right? We talked about the if you don't do the attribution uh, earlier, kind of what's the next order effect? I believe it was you that brought that up there, right? What what do they do next, right? Um, and so, you know, this is something that I, I think in the forensic side we deal with all the time uh, on you know criminal act, right? Where there are a very limited subset of criminal actions that you have to report, and and everything else um, you probably are not uh, well, probably not nothing. You are legally not required to report, but ethically maybe should or shouldn't depending on who's paying the bill, right? And what their concerns are and the whole, and I'll tell you that regularly I do forensics cases where I see evidence of crime uh, that we don't report, and that could be a whole separate discussion down the way there, and what's that, out of scope, out of scope, but it's, it's very, I think it's very related though, right? Because particularly here when you're talking about a contract uh, type thing where somebody says, yeah, you know, bury that because it could kill somebody, or they say publish it because it's your job, right? And then you say, I'm not gonna publish it because it's, I think it's easier on the bury versus leak side, right? Because some organization can bury, but I think it's a great, kind of a great topic, great thing to think about. Sir? I had an idea. Uh, I used to work in the restaurant business, and a lot of times people would uh, crack their teeth on something they ate, and mm -hmm. whether it be a bone or sometimes a foreign object that had gotten into the food, and then they would threaten to sue us. But we did some research and we found out that nine, nine times out of ten, or even greater than that, uh, the, the cases would be thrown out because it would be decided that if the, if the tooth was going to be broken by that, then it was very likely that it was going to be broken anyway. Right? And I think that by analogy we could argue that a similar case is here, that these events don't happen in a vacuum, right. and that my reporting things does not actually instigate this war. It's that we're at the tipping point where this is just one straw on yeah. a camel's back. Sorry to mix analogies, but no. you know, like, at what point do we just decide, you know, we're not putting straws on camels anymore because you know, <laughs> eventually one of them might break somebody's back. So that, That's a great... Uh that, that's a one. I was unaware of the uh, issue with the restaurant business thing. I did chip a tooth actually at a. Uh, I don't know if I'm legally allowed to say where. I don't think I am. I chipped a tooth at a major chain uh, when when they had a, a broken uh, dish actually in, um, you know, piece of a broken uh, broken piece of uh, you know dishware there uh, in the uh, in the piece and and uh, they just immediately settled with me and that was it right. They they cut me a check and called it a day. Um, but I, I didn't think about the fact uh, that you know again. If, if that tooth broke there, it was probably going to break eventually anyway. Um, that's fascinating, right? And here, I, I do agree with you, right? If this is the, if this is literally the straw that breaks the camel's back, then, then we, are, we are already at a tipping point, right? Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a great point, no, no question. 
Well, it is a big straw. There's no, and I intentionally, look, I, I'll be the first to tell you, I intentionally threw this up here for that reason, right? Because I, I think it's easier to start, I mean, when we start talking about ethical norms and what are the, what are our ethical norms as well as what should our nationally, right, internationally ethical norms be around this, um, I, I think it helps to start with those, with those big straws, right? Um, because it's a, you know, it, it separates the, is this a big deal from the, what should we do about it, knowing that it's a big deal, right? So, so I, I try to have, when, when possible, when I'm doing analysis, I try to separate those into binary conditions, right? And so here, again, by throwing such a big straw out here, right, I, I think it's, it's important then that we can have the discussion without focusing on, is the power grid a big deal? I don't think anybody here is willing to stand up and be like, you know, is the power grid a big deal, right? I don't think anybody's flashing black on the backside and being like, no, no, not a big deal. The heck with it, let them burn it to the ground, right? So, so it's very intentional that we start with that. But that, just you know, that's, that's why. It was, it was definitely an intentional decision. Sir? I'm actually uh, reminded of the 1983 incident mm -hmm. with Stanislav Petrov. Uh, who was actually a lieutenant colonel in a submarine, which is under the case of how confident must we be in the attribution. Mm -hmm. And he was ordered to fire nuclear weapons upon U.S. soil because the submarine had picked up information that the United States had launched a nuclear attack upon them. Um, and he, like, did not do this, and he did not start World War III because of his in inaction, even though it was his obligation, his duty, and a direct order, and he faced a court-martial. Um, so... I think that like you need to have supreme confidence in your attribution, and even that, then you need to actually realize what the long-term loss of life of your actions would be, right? Because even though it is 100,000 in your first incidents, the escalation of that and the geopolitical environment that it creates could cause like ramifications that go down like for th hundreds of years. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Although, uh, if you'll stay at the mic for a second here, on that attribution side, right? Uh, you know, you talk about confidence here. He wasn't confident, and it's, that's been well published. And, and it's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal analogy. And, and I, I wish I thought of it myself, actually. Um, but the uh, phenomenal analogy, seriously, um, he didn't. Though it's it's well public that that he had experienced multiple other, uh, basically multiple other malfunctions of his equipment, um, and the equipment that was uh, basically the reason that they'd sent him the order to fire, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and he had exper experienced multiple other issues there. In fact, uh, there's, I don't know if you've read The Dead Hand or, or know about The Dead Hand system, Never. but there was a, uh, Russia basically built a, a system in case of a massive nuclear war uh, that knocked out their communications and knocked out uh, everything else that would still fire their weapons regardless, right? And so they called it The Dead Hand system. Basically, if they weren't continuously getting a ping, if there was nobody uh, basically coming back and saying, yep, we're still alive, we're still alive, don't fire, don't fire, they were going to fire, right? And, and several times, they had systems uh, around that that detected launches, right, from, from the U.S., uh, launching over the, uh, basically over the North Pole, um, and, and several other operators decided, based on, on, you know, confidence in their data, not to fire. And I'm curious, uh, from a cyber standpoint, right, um, what's, what do you think the, uh, the parallel is there, right? So, so in, in having that lack of confidence in data? Um, I think, like, there's a large amount of certainty in the, like, confidence of data in mm -hmm. modern day, uh, which is why, like, the Petrov example isn't totally analogous. But um, I think it's also easy to fals uh, falsify attribution uh, of an attacker uh, and, like, basically say, oh, the Russians stole our election when it was the Chinese, or, oh, the Chinese are interfering when it was actually uh, Russian influences. And I think the ability to falsify that information, which has become so easy, uh, does kind of hurt the ability to attribute attacks to a certain extent if the attacker is extremely experienced and if that's their direct intent. The attack isn't, but the attribution misalignment is. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great, uh, great point. I, I would... I would partially argue uh, for, for a moment, just kind of devil's advocate, right? You, you know, you said that it's not totally analogous to the 1983 Petrov situation because uh, our data is better, right? But then simultaneously said that the, you know, that uh, basically that the misattribution, intentional misattribution is, is a big deal. Um, we also have systems that, that, you know, routinely malfunction, right? And, uh, you know, fail to provide data. So very often it's a scenario where it's not a question of is the data itself accurate, right? Very often we say, hey, I detected this on system A and if this other condition doesn't exist on system B, 
then, right? You know, basically, if one and not the other, then it's a true positive, right? But if system B has malfunctioned, right, and simply isn't providing that data, right, then then what appears to be a true positive is 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 not really, right? Um, and so so this is a scenario I run into a lot with incident response, right, where a particular system simply isn't collecting, and people make bad judgments based on the the unavailability of data, right, where they don't even realize the data isn't there. So I'd I, I'd be interested to know like your you know have you experienced that or what your thoughts are around that? I don't have much experience on like data attribution, mm -hmm. um, so I can't really speak to it to the level that you can. But in instances where you like can't attribute properly in that manner, being aware of that and just like uh, like staying your hand would probably be the best recourse. I can't disagree with that at all. I agree 100 percent. Right. So know what your data is telling you. Stay your hand. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sir. I think to that point, it's uh, you know everyone in the room that knows your background is uh, you know pretty telling you get up in front of the room and numerous times today you've gone well you're never 100% confident and you so aren't. with someone with your sort of background saying that I think that's very telling that well gee if if someone who's highly experienced is never 100% confident in the attribution that's probably not it should never be the tipping point to yes. War, you know, at, at at most it's you know I think realistically what we would see, uh, you know, at, at least in the U.S. is this would push some further action, mm -hmm. uh, some further intelligence, whatever. That it's like okay, well, we're pretty sure we know who it is, so we're going to go off and do some targeted action to confirm that before it escalated to this level. Yeah, so, so taking smaller scale actions instead of escalating to the level of war. Yeah, 100% behind you on that. sources of intelligence on the same event before moving forward with public attribution. Yes. So that's the key. Multiple sources of intelligence on a single event before moving forward with any uh, pub with it before moving forward with public attribution. Yeah. Although um, I I'm going to devil's advocate you here and point out that uh, even private attribution um, or, or lack thereof can have a significant impact on foreign policy and, and, and actions taken. So absolutely agreed. Um, however. Uh, I think it is a personal responsibility to determine if you want to work in an organization where private attribution uh, within, you know, that's being only shared in a certain element, if it is acted on unilaterally without collaborating sources based on level of confidence and whether or not all source analysis uh, using multiple sources is happening before attribution, that is an ethical choice. Whether or not you want to work in an organization would make a decision based on one unilateral piece of digital evidence which could have absolutely been misattributed. Preach. I love it. Um, seriously. Like that. That more than anything else, I mean, that, that's really something that, that wanted to talk about, wanted to get across uh, today, right, is that when you work in, right, when you work in cyber threat intelligence, right, and I think it's difficult to know whether or not, you know, to your scenario, whether or not you're working in an organization where when you publish this, this will be the outcome, right? A single piece of private reporting. There's some faith there and some, and definitely situational, right? You may think you're, you may think that would never happen. And of course the reality is we, we know actually that the national intelligence estimate, right? The annual national intelligence estimate draws routinely from, because this is widely public, it's widely open. The national intelligence estimate pulls from vendor reports. Right, and we know this, and so as you as a vendor, uh, both private and public vendor reports, right? Um, and so a private meaning, of course, you know, private to a very small circle, and uh, but uh, does does pull from that, right? And and then policymakers do make assessments based on that. One of my goals today was to get people thinking about: Do you want to be involved personally? in CTI in the first place, right? Because what you do, the attributions that you make, absolutely impact people's lives, and in some cases, end them. Right, realistically, in some cases, end them. Right, and you might be okay with that, and you may be okay with that, and you may not be. And a lot of people getting into CTI uh, are not thinking about that as part of their decision. And I would throw out there one of my goals, at least, was to walk away, hopefully, having started a conversation about when should we be doing attribution? What are you personally comfortable with? Is this something that you want to, uh, yeah, that you want to do? Anyway, sir. Uh, I think the one part of this that's missing that mm -hmm. is is we're not mature in the way we think of proportionate response, especially combining cyber to kinetics. And I don't have an answer, but it bothers me. 
Yeah, so proportionate response, actually to this gentleman's point, the Talon manual actually tries to address that. Tries. Um, I don't think they have an answer either, but, but to your point, that, that's, that's incredibly profound, right? What is a proportionate response, um, you know, for, for cyber versus kinetic, right? When we move out of the cyber world into the, into the kinetic side, it is, uh, it's, it's tough to know what the proportionate response is, right? Uh, to this other gentleman's point though, right, if you don't respond, you know, what is that next impact going to be, right? We already know that you've got somebody with an intent to impact uh, or a group with an intent to impact. How, how does that change the game? So yeah, love it, love it. So, so I want to kick over another scenario here, um, 10 minutes, I'll tell you what, I'm going to flip forward to here. Um, and. Uh, <clears throat> Talk about uh, does the attributed nation impact the ethics here? And this is probably, we'll close on this one here. Um, and this is, we're looking at an attribution here. Sanctions are going to be levied against the country. And I'm just going to use the Russia example here, right? Russia only because, and by the way, if you're Russian, I don't dislike you or anything. I just dislike the Russian government. We're good there. Um, but uh, look, the, uh, you know, if it's Russia, who's generally a unfriendly country, considered by most, right? Versus, uh, let's say, France, which is generally a, a generally a friendly country, uh, you know, considered by most, or at least considered by most to be friendly. Um, do, do, we, do we care here about the loss of, uh, basically loss of, loss of jobs here in the U.S., right? So I'm, I'm making this very U.S. centric, right? So, and if you're not from the U.S., uh, substitute that back here. Um, so if we publish the attribution, right? So let's say here, um, you know, basically does the, you know, we were ready to publish the attribution, we're set. Uh, one minute we thought it was Russia, we're going to publish publicly. Um, and then uh, new data comes to light that says, nope, that's definitely France. And uh, that's going to impact, let's say, thousands of jobs here in the U.S. and ultimately cause uh, financial and personal strife for people here. Does the country that we're naming and possibly as a result, the, uh, obviously the concern back to, uh, you know, the, um, uh, certainly the impact back to us domestically, how does that change, change our ethical uh, requirements and attribution? Do you want to speak to this one? Yeah, that's tough, right? That, it's intentionally tough, right? But I, I have thoughts here too, by the way, but go ahead first. Jobs in this instance are secondary to me to diplomatic relationships and other operations that may be taking place amongst nations, more diplomatic relationships. If you were to put this as diplomatic relationships, I'd say yes. If you consider this jobs, um, I honestly think it's just a really, really, really gray line. So it's a really gray line if it's jobs, but you think it's more black and white and if it's, if it's policy? If it's, international if it's policy. diplomatic, international policy, war, things like that, I feel uh, that, uh, yeah, that it's a little more black and white. Absolutely. Well, I think here, the, and I don't disagree with you, but I think here what we're looking at is sanctions uh, being levied, which of course are, yeah, sanctions are diplomatic. Correct. Right? Um, okay. But the so ultimate saying, outcome you're is. The sanctions themselves are diplomatic, so does the fact that it's a diplomatic Well, it's service, both. But see, uh, yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah. Ooh, that's, that's tough. This is a really, really, really tough one. Um, because do I think that the country matters? Absolutely. Do I think it matters who it affects? Everyone's going to have their own national interests, so absolutely. Do I think it's different if you're a global organization? You've got to look at the, the impact to the organization that's doing the release and what countries they deal with, work in, et cetera, and their entire play field. If we're talking about an individual organization, vendor report, um, that's going to play into it. If we're dealing directly with a nation, their allegiances and other relations may play into it. And I don't think it's as simple as just a loss of jobs. If I'm going to play, live in a scenario, and Jessica, it's just a matter of jobs, and country A, country B, your country's going to lose jobs. Eh, I have a different economic impact view on jobs than I do on human life. And I hold those in different regards. I, I tend to care. I tend to think that. It depends on how, in the U.S., there are some safety nets, maybe not for medical, where those aren't the ethical discussions we're having. Um, but I think I'm a little more comfortable with it with jobs than things that would affect diplomatic relations. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, I, I can't disagree with, with that. Um, so, so, yeah, in this particular scenario, it's really difficult to separate the, the two, right? Uh, you know, the, the diplomatic from the, you know, from, from the personal side. Um, I'm fascinated to hear your thoughts as well here. Again, you know, as you step war, up to the mic to make sure we're good. As going. with war, you know, levying sanctions is a team effort. So it's not like this is going to, you know, a single attribution is not going to necessarily cause that to happen necessarily. <laughs> but again, but the other problem is, of course, you've mentioned France, and these, that's filled with a bunch of cheese-eating surrender monkeys. And I don't think wow. that's really, I mean, that's worse than Russia. Wah, 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 wah. Okay, well, 
Now, now, hold on. Now, just for those that don't know, France has a very active computer network exploitation program and, and a very, very active industrial espionage program. <laughs> and they were chosen for, seriously, they were chosen as, as a friendly country that steals lots of intellectual property. I didn't pick France out of a bag here and be like, hey, let's grab another. They're considered generally friendly. A lot of folks don't know they have an active economic espionage program. They do, right? Um, they're on par with China. They're just better at it. Right? So, I mean, I don't know what else to say other than, you know. But I think to your point there, I mean, they're, they're not necessarily, you're right, uh, this, this is a team sport. Um, I, I do disagree, though. While I think that a single attribution is unlikely to take us to war, or less likely to take us to war, I think it is much more likely to create sanctions that themselves will have uh, a predictable impact on U.S. jobs. Right? But I don't think he's saying that it's the linchpin. I think he's saying somebody else has to take a vote. Like the oh, gotcha. Right, so you're saying that it's not a single person implementing sanctions as a result, it's Congress versus a, right? But, but of course, acting on your, acting on your analysis, <laughs> potentially. Right, right? that's true. But again, you know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, yeah. living sanctions is a major diplomatic event. And mm -hmm. it, so that is something that, you know, you have to mobilize the whole government to perform that. Yeah. Yep. And it's really unlikely that that single attribution is really going to do that. I, I don't think... You know, when the U.S. went to war with uh, Germany in the First World War, it, it, there was like a long line of things that Germany had to do to eventually drive America yep. to, to declare war. So I, just like that, it's, it's not going to happen immediately. Fair enough. Yep. <laughs> Sir? So since I uh, like to say things that uh, rile people, when it comes to uh, the business impact of thousands of people using their jobs, there's scholarly articles written about how that increases suicide in the individual, in their children, breaks up families, Fair. and so Fair. death is written right across there in my mind. Um, uh, one of the things that we keep talking about uh, too, it, it, if we break this down in the in the five ethical working theories, we have a, a few of the general ethics that are fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. and that's that's why we're just we're talking about it. Indeed. But, and the reason why we try to associate a value uh, to certain things, such as life, is because a couple of the, wor the workable ethical theories actually um, weigh the pros and the cons, right? Um, so, but really what we're talking about is, is how confident am I? Am I lying? So it, it, having a high level of confidence, but it should not play at all what country it is. Okay. Except for, there are a few work of the ethical theories that will let you weigh that in, but then you'd have to be thinking very myopically. So... What about the ethics of the country and how they would treat so, people who are, who so, lose their jobs? So is it, is it ethical for a country to think about only their things and not about how it affects others? No, but that's the reality. So, uh, and, and actually there, there is some ethic, uh, ethical discussions around that, but, but we shouldn't. <laughs> Wait, right, hold on a sec. We have Mike. We're losing the mic here. Yep. Yeah. If you will, please come up to the mic. Thanks. Um, if it's France and they've got a good social safety net, to man's point, you will end up, that person will then fall back on that social safety net. If it's Russia, they're going to have a whole different life when they lose their job. So. Yeah. And even in the scenario here, I was looking at basically your attribution causing job loss at home, not in the foreign country itself, right? Um, although that certainly would be another ethical discussion that we could have separately. It's it's a little bit harder to you know to, to think about that in in terms of away from home. So but, there yeah. are five workable ethical theories, and that plays into two of them. Yes. So um, yes. of the uh, and the two of them that it plays into, one of them is the one that it's okay to kill people under certain circumstances. So. Um. Yeah, no, I, I think the big thing I took away from this, by the way, though, and I, I love the point, is that economic damage isn't just economic damage. Then when we look at it like that, it's a very myopic view, and, and I, I don't disagree with that at all. And maybe some of us do it intentionally to make our own career choices. Yeah, maybe some of us intentionally look at economic views as, or economic damage as only economic damage, and we do it through cognitive dissonance, right, to allow us to look in the mirror every day and go to work. <laughs> and, and even sanctions is a, a pretty broad spectrum mm -hmm. there that, uh, I mean, it could be, you know, everything from, oh, just a little, uh, okay, maybe a couple jobs are lost to, oh, we've got an entire trade war and entire industries need to be bailed out and that sort of thing. And, uh, I mean, the important point 
that should be brought up here is with the, the APT1 report that it wasn't government sanctions, but Google actively in response yes. to Mandiant's investigation said we are rolling back yes. what we are going to be doing yes. in China. And that did definitely have uh, economic impact on a U.S. corporation. But quite frankly, Google ain't doing so bad today. So. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, uh, I think that's where we're uh, we're going to cut it out here. Uh, Shane, uh, is, uh, give me the five minute to go and then the one minute to go signal here. I uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Very I will. Much. I will give you the last word, but I did want to say that oh, someone good. mentioned earlier that it's unlikely that we're going to come up with an axiomatic or a, a, a programmatic way to come to these decisions. There's no. There's not going to be any algorithm that we're able to tick a bunch of boxes and then uh, here's the outcome. But uh, I think that being the case, uh, that's the reason why we created this village yeah. was because we need to start finding out what the kind of questions are that we do need to be asking. Yes. And so because we have to make these decisions, right? And as people, we need to know like, what the questions are. So I want to thank everyone for being here and for contributing to the conversation. And especially, uh, Jake, thank you for coming and asking these, these uh, great questions. Yeah, no, and, and hey, thank you so much for putting this together. Again, I don't, I don't have the answer answers here either, right? I mean, I, I have opinions on everything out here. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty vocal on a lot of those opinions. If you follow me on Twitter or read blogs or, or publications and, and whatnot where I, I contribute to. But uh, you know, to that point, right, I, I'm, I'm positive I'm not right about everything either. Um, and uh, I appreciate the Ethics Village for setting this up and giving us this, uh, this opportunity to discuss this. Because while we're not going to create an axiomatic framework, I, I think this works a lot like tabletops, right, for incident response. When we go in and do a tabletop, for instance, we can't possibly work through all of the possible incident response scenarios scenarios and how we're going to deal with each one of those. We do tabletops as generalizations to say, hey, here's how we'd react to this type of thing, right? And, and I think when we have discussions like this, we can start to build scenarios out where at least it's predictable what our response is going to be uh, given a particular set of inputs. And, and I think that without that, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing uh, for us to do. And, and as we build those out, I think it's important, of course, obviously, to consider the ethics of that, right? So um, I'll, I'll break here. Uh, by the way, I'll mention uh, if you want some, uh, uh, we, we Played off. This isn't completely ethically uh, whatever, but I forgot to take the second bag of this to who's slide last night. Um, you may remember, and I don't know what the ethics of selling your gamer bathwater are, um, but uh, this gamer on Twitter was selling bathwater, uh, her bathwater for like 30 bucks, uh, and uh, that created a big, st you know, big stink. And I made a joke about, uh, well, uh, what I would do instead is sell hacker urine. Uh, basically, you could spray that on your servers, right? Um, and it would mark your territory so other hackers wouldn't come compromise your systems. And then one of the folks who works for me, um, who, uh, yeah, anyway, he went and bought a bunch of uh, little perfume bottles here, uh, way too many of these, um, and uh, filled them with food coloring. I'm assured that it's only food coloring, right? <laughs> um, but uh, it is Hacker Your Own Protector Servers, and it says Now Stops Pandas, or Now Repels Pandas, excuse me. Uh, so if you have a Chinese store. So if you want one of these as a memento, uh, I need to get rid of these because I don't want to carry around another 60 vials of Hacker Urine for the next, uh, anyway. Appreciate everybody coming out. Thanks.